Welcome to every, everybody. Welcome to the next talk on International Campus Waldorf. I'm happy to see you all again. I'm, I'm happy to welcome especially our um, lecturer for today. It's Professor Dr. Wilfried Sommer. Wilfried is a dear colleague of mine at Alanus University. We share a lot of common world of experience. We have a lot of common projects together. And Wilfred um, holds a PhD in physics from Frankfurt University. And he has done his PhD project about phenomenology in, in physics and in, in optics. And he is still now, till now, um, although he has many other obligations, he's still now an um, active Waldorf teacher. Not so many professors in teacher training do that. And he is one of them being a real Waldorf teacher and a teacher and doing teacher training um, at the same time. Um, teaching sevens, eighths grades at Waldorf School Kassel and um, high school, of course, too. And he is one of the board members of the teacher training center in Kassel. His response has many good ideas to bring Waldorf in the world. One of his ideas is to have a youth symposium where young Waldorf students from all over Germany right now, more than 200 often, come together for a symposium to topics which are topics of our time. It might be interesting for young high school students. And he also at Kassel, Waldorf, um, And, um, center, there is an initiative, an international teacher training um, course. It's every Easter time for two weeks. People from all over all over the world come together to do teacher training in, I don't know, many languages are gathered there. So some of you might know this place already. He has um, recently published a book. Um, it's also translated into English. I put it into the, into the chat. Um, so you can download it. Um, um, understanding born in the resonant space of embodiment. And this is his new research project. It's a, um, he started with phenomenology and now he's totally into the topic of um, embodiment questions. And what does this idea of embodiment mean for didactical situations in, in world of schools? And I'm very happy to have you here and have your lecture today, Wilfried. The stage is yours. Thank you, Joost, for introducing me so kindly. Where am I? I am in my physics lab in Kassel. And that physics lab is one of our seminar rooms. And it is also a room of the Institute for Subject Related Methodology in Kassel. And that institute is closely affiliated to Alanus. So the teacher training college and this Institute for Subject Related Methodology work together. And it's one of the ways Alanus is embedded in the Federation of Steiner Ward of Schools in Germany. And Katharina, may I ask you to put in the chat this in-service training that Joost has already announced. And next Easter, Easter 2022, we will have in our refresher course week, the week before Easter, the main focus, grade nine, and the international community can participate online. It will be a Zoom event. The German event will be face to face. And usually our international event is face to face too. But of course, next year it will be online only. Okay. And now I am going to change my position. And so I will change my camera too, and you will meet me in front of the blackbird again. And you have to wait a minute. So here I am. And tomorrow morning, I will be teaching an elective in grade 11, a contextual approach to the atom will be the topic tomorrow. And we will discuss in that elective how the gravitational interaction and the electromagnetic interaction can be brought together 
in a logical construction called atom. So that is my business in school at the moment. And now I'm going to start my lecture, the dialogical dimension of general didactics in Steiner Waldorf schools. And I would like to start with a short vignette related to grade one. And then I would like to jump into grade six into a science lesson. And then I will use bo both to look at the phase structure of the main lesson blocks in Steiner Waldorf schools. And that might be the point of departure to look in a more general sense to the didactics in Steiner Waldorf schools. Okay, let's start with a short vignette related to grade one. It has been several years when I met a young girl. She went to, a, to the first grade in a Steiner Waldorf school and she came from a family where the parents were highly educated and she had siblings and of course she already read books before school had started and she had read a lot of books already and during a chat she told me that of course she was able to read and write but now in grade one she had the wonderful situation that she really got to know all the capital letter she used while reading. And so she was very contented in grade one that she really got to know all the letters, even though she was already able to read and write. And I had the impression that that young girl had a wonderful school experience and she was embedded in her class and she experienced in a new way what does it mean to learn to read and write and what had actually happened for example she heard a story from her teacher about a snake in the desert and that snake experienced a lot and after she had heard that story, she painted a picture and in that picture, she actually caught the atmosphere where she had lived in during that story with a snake. He actually breathed life, breathed, breathed life into that story with her painting. And on the next day, she got to know that there is the capital letter S and this capital letter S has a certain semiotic meaning and that is represented the way she got to know it. And relating this story to a more general look at didactics, she actually she actually experienced in a first phase a shared encounter with all her classmates and in that shared encounter she lived in an atmosphere where the snake really was present in the middle of the desert. And so she had the co-presence with everybody and she used that co-presence to dive into an experience with that snake. And the next point was to breathe life into that encounter. By drawing a picture and during she did that in some sort she was aligning to what she was had actually experienced during the story was presented so i just denote here aligning and in a third step 
she discovered that in the snake is a certain meaning and that meaning is in the realm of mental picturing with a certain structure. I just write down here to discover meaning. And that discovery of meaning was into some, to some extent a changing of perspective. The picture she had painted, the picture the teacher had painted, the pictures everybody had painted, transformed into that capital letter S and she contributed to an inner movement and in that inner movement there was one of the key issues, the changing of a perspective. So on this side, I just wrote down some aspects of three phases in the learning pathway of that first grader. And on the other part here, I wrote something that is more general by looking at the situation in class. And I, it, I could add to the co-presents here the joint intentionality of everybody forming that atmosphere. And then the lining is that you make it more your business. And on the next point here, the changing of the perspective is also the experience of a joint intentionality while the semiotic meaning is discovered. And so she experienced these three steps. And I had the impression that that young girl was really glad to get to know it in a new way. And even though she was able to read and write, she really liked that lessons and she contributed to a learning pathway and she actually learned something in that lesson. It was not just being there, it was just really a learning pathway that was worth experiencing, experiencing it in that lesson. And now I would like to look at these three steps in a completely other situation, not in the story presented a great one, not in painting a picture, but in grade six, at the very beginning of dealing with warmth, warmth in a physics main lesson block. And now I would like to share this experience online and I will need freezing cold water, I will need boiling water, and I will need hand hot water. And so I have to organize it for a second. And I also have to change the background that you will see the methylene blue I am going to use in this experiment. So you will have one or two minutes and I have to get settled with everything. See you soon. So that is methylene blue and I don't use ink because ink actually completely dissolves at temperatures around 90 degrees. They developed ink this way in order to help parents to clean the clothes of their children if they are ink spots on it. So you have to change ink today into methylene blue. And for people who just jumped in, it's ice cold. It is really freezing cold here. Hand warm. Hmm. I'm not going to continue that. And now I will keep my mouth shut and we will have 
some sort of experience. Next step, freezing cold, hand hot. Next step, freezing cold, hand hot, boiling hot. Isn't that nice? And now I'm going to change the setting and I will continue soon. So, related to my introduction with the short vignette, we just started with phase one. And that phase was the, what they call it, the state's demonstration. And now, with that shared encounter, where I kept my mouth shut, and not the teacher spoke, the world actually spoke, spoke and reve revealed itself. During that part, I tried to get you immersed into what actually happened. And now in school, of course, students have to take notes. They have to breathe life to, into it because they experienced a lot. They have to order it. And I, now I would like to take notes with you like I would do it in class. And in class, the students learn, so taking notes, that you have a setup 
in the demonstration that you have the executing and you have the observations observation and now the setup was pretty clear you had three bakers we had three bakers And these three bakers were filled with water at different temperatures. So it here it was freezing, freezing cold. Here it was hand hot and here it was boiling hot. And that is the setup. And then what we actually did, we used methylene blue and this methylene blue was dropped in. So that is part one here. Now part two will be here and it's very easy. I just have to draw this drop here and here's the water surface and the water, the methylene blue drops haven't met the water surface yet. And then the observation can be drawn in a way by the students themselves like everybody observed it. So my job as a teacher is to provide a certain structure here. But of course, by taking notes, the students can draw that by themselves. And wasn't that impressive that we had this fast dissolving here and here we had nearly a freely falling methylene blue drop it was like a falling drop but not really a freely falling drop but to some extent it was a clear structure an upright line here and here we had something in between so you can do that by yourself and just to remember, I draw that line here and then we have a structure here and it remained. Could you see how it remained? And here, the dissolving started earlier. And in class, I wouldn't contribute that. I would ask the students what was really impressing. What did you draw? What did you draw? And then we can create an atmosphere that everybody can contribute a little bit and we can develop emotions in a way that we really connect with what we have experienced before. So that is a way to take notes here and that is in correspondence to grade one where the students paint a painting to connect with what they had experienced in the story before and my job here is to provide all the terms needed and then the students can just make a description as homework and now I would like to proceed to the next step. We had just step two to step three to discover meaning. And I would like to do this in a way that you can connect it to phase one and two. And so I am going to clean the blackboard now and then we will proceed.
the following day I maybe I would I just used these drawings here on the blackboard and I would take away everything here and to have a whole blackboard available now I just continue here this way that you can connect it and then we can review or evaluate that situation and one of the questions that might rise is what does happen or what is happening if, the, if we have warm water? What is happening if we have warm water? And then it is a matter of course we have movement. Okay, and what's different in cold water? Oh, the movement must be reduced because we had this falling of the methylene blue here. Does really the water move? That is one of the central learning difficulties. Or does the methylene blue move? Or the water has to move because the methylene is in the middle of a liquid. So if the methylene blue moves, the water moves too. Okay. So what changes if we increase the temperature? We have an increasement of the movement too. And what changes if we reduce the temperature? Okay, then the form is preserved. So the movement is reduced. So the movement decreases and the form is preserved. Here we have a predominance of form. Here we have a predominance of dissolving. And then we can, might just add in this direction internal movement increases. And everybody will be able later to write a comment here too, and that the students do not forget it. We make just a couple of points here. Okay. Yes, and if we, it's just we have water here, and if it gets more and more colder, we have ice here, and we have steam here. Who, th who does think that that is logical? Who does think that that is logical? And now you can start to think about it. And it is pretty logical that we have steam here and we have the experience of boiling water because we have an increase, the, the inner movement increases, increases, increases here. And then we reach a point where the increasement is that strong that we have the transition to steam. So that we have a boiling here, I just denote here to boil. And what about the other situation? If the internal movement is reduced, since the temperature is reduced, the form becomes more and more predominating. And then we reach a transition where water just can preserve its form. And that is called ice. So we can just write here that we have this transition of freezing. And I just write it here to freeze. And here it becomes a solid, and here it becomes a gas. And at that point, I have to introduce as a teacher other terms here. This term is to condense. Steam condenses to condense. 
And that is a term everybody knows, ice melts. So, we get a pathway from a solid with its form to steam without any form. And now we have learned four terms here. And it's pretty logical that that happens because we can see the inner movement here. And with following that inner movement, it makes sense that you have the transi transition this way at that point and another transition at this point. And if you have reached this, then as a teacher, you just have to introduce that that is called a liquid fluid water, that is called a solid, and every substance on the world has that three phases, and that is called a gas. And the transition from a liquid to a gas in a more general way is called to evaporate. To condense doesn't change. That is called, if you have any substance and not water, that is called to solidify. And to melt doesn't change. And now we have here an overview. And that overview is derived from our experience here. And these three bakers with water with different temperatures are observed with the methylene blue. And now we take a step back and we look at it more generally, not what happens step after step. We look at it more generally. We build a mental picture and the internal movement that increases or decreases is the center to look more generally at it. And you can introduce first by relating to water, the steam and the, the ice. And by relating to any substance, you can relate the liquid to a solid and to a gas. And now the students would be able to take that picture, that is phase three here. Now we are discovering the laws, we are discovering meaning, and you can give them challenges to write something in their main lesson book in a silent work. For example, what does the, bl the blue arrow denote? That is very easy. And the more challenging part would be describe step by step what happens if an ice cube gets warmer and warmer and warmer. And then they have to describe the whole process here. And you can just tell them that there are very specific situations in that. You call you use the term to boil if the whole volume has the transition from a liquid to a gas. But you have also the situation that you see puddles on a rainy day. And even if you have a temperature of eight degrees Celsius, they are gone after an hour and they do not boil. There you have an effect on the surface that the liquid evaporates. In German, you call it verdunsten and not verdampfen. In English, it's not that clear. In English, you used to evaporate frequently to denote that the surface contributes. And that is possible from one degree Celsius up to 100 degrees Celsius on the surface. And if the whole of volume has the transition from a liquid into a gas, then you have the bubbles in here and then you have 
it in the whole volume and call it to boil. And you have the same effect here from minus 40 up until the zero point on the temperature scale. The ice cube has a small liquid film on it. And that is like this evaporation you already have on the ice cube, the transition into the liquid, the form is preserved. And you use it, for example, for ice skating. And then the plates have this water film under it. Those, so a student can just describe, okay, below minus 40 degrees Celsius, the ice cube is really solid. Then you have a liquid film you can use for ice skating. Then you have that transition into a liquid. Now the surface contributes to evaporation. The inner movement increases. Then it starts boiling at 100 degrees Celsius and you have the steam. And that is the way students learn in grade six that you have three phases in substances and they can connect through this experience of inner movement in here. They can relate to it phenomenologically, they can see it, but now phenomenolo phenomenology means that you start thinking by remaining connected to your observations and your experiences. And I just try to show you how students can develop that in a grade six main lesson. And that is not a very difficult main lesson here. And then you can just have something like a comprehensive vantage point for your silent work, where you describe some questions in your main lesson book on your own. And that is a way to connect to physics. And I used that example because I didn't want to go to the higher grades where you have to have a certain pre-knowledge. And but the structure can be remained in higher grades and you can proceed in a comparable way. Okay. Now I will need two or three minutes just to clean the blackboard. And if there are any questions relating to these three phases in physics, then you should ask them now because then they will be gone. You have just to start, it's otherwise I will... one, one question, one question, Wilfred. You, you speak about internal movement. Um, you mean the movement within the glass. This is yes, meant by water. internal. Okay. Okay. It's not yes. a typical physical okay, expression. Yes. Ida is, has a question. Yes, thank you so much, Wilfried. My question is just what did you find the most challenging in running this experiment because it's so gripping I really want to do it with our children tomorrow. The challenge is to have the methylene blue because ink dissolves in the boiling hot water you can't see it and ask the biology teacher because you use methylene blue for microscopy and maybe it is available. Otherwise, you will cheat a little bit the students because the dissolving of the ink at 90 degrees is a chemical reaction and not a movement then. Or just take, try it with 80 degrees Celsius. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And take a small syringe and take only one drop and move the piston slowly. Thank you. Okay. Okay, one last glimpse on this, how you proceed using the Blackbird. And in teacher training, I am always working hard with our trainees that the Blackbird really supports the learning pathway. And that is one suggestion, how you can shape it. And in glass, I would do it this way. I would remove 
after the first day, after the demonstration, everything besides the three bakers, and then I would start with this directly here. And I frequently use the blackbird from phase two in phase three. <clears throat> May I have a question in between? Yes. Um, probably it's a stupid question. If I do this, I guess the children are thrilled, of course. Can I have precisely the same effect if I bring cold water into a boiling process? Yeah, this is in a boiling process. If I water boil water, means water. rapid dissolving, and that will be the problem. You will have a dissolving of the cold water and the warm water immediately. Yeah, okay. And yeah, yeah. And now you make that visible through this uh, color. And if you just boil water, you don't see it and you don't see anything. Yeah. And in boiling water, you have bubbles, that means steam, and you have li liquid, the water, and that is moving and the bubbles increase, flow together and so on. Yeah. But basically the same pro uh, process. Yes, and you are an excellent student, Christoph, because you just did exactly the movement the students are asked to do by asking the question, is it logical that we have steam here? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Or that we have boiling here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have two open questions. What happens if the temperature increases? And then you can just discuss all the learning difficulties. And the other question is, is the boiling logical? Yeah. Okay. Or the freezing. Thank you. And so they can really gain a certain step of understanding without using a model. It is just starting thinking by staying connected to the appearances themselves. So now we went through this vignette related to grade one. We went to this physics demonstration and concept building and reviewing related to grade six. And now I would like to look at this phase structure, which is one of the core signature in Steiner World of Education in main lessons, more generally. And we started with that shared encounter and that is a term John McEllis introduced to underline that you really are together while meeting something new. And in history, it is a presentation or a story presented. In biology, it might be a drawing related to organs in maths. It might be some exercises that are leading the students to something new and so on and so forth. It was a story and it was in physics a demonstration. And more generally speaking, you can call that world. It's meeting the world and it's a shared encounter. And now I'm going to use the terms of educational sciences. You have the self-world relation, and that is the world in that part here. And what you actually have during that phase is a certain co-presence. I already wrote that down, co-presence. And in that co-presence, the, the students can just develop the sympathy, which sustains their empathy to stay connected with the world. So it's an act of sympathy and the, all the will acti activities are directed towards the world. It's a centrifugal movement and you are directly 
in resonance to your perceiving bodily constitution and you are oriented towards the world. You are in the first person and second person perspective. First and second person perspective. Second person perspective means that you feel like somebody else felt in a story yet that you use your empathy to connect to what other persons might experience and perspective. Or you can also denote it as a will activity that is directed towards the world. And now that means that you have to accept emotionally the world like it is. And Steiner World of Education develops a culture that you connect to something new without being cognitively activated and just bringing all the preconcepts you have and the pre-knowledge. It's without sharing pre-knowledge, it's just encountering. So you accept emotionally what happens. And then you, if you have that and you aren't allowed to speak because it just happens, then you need really a face where you can connect yourself in your way with it. And I call that for the lower grade to breathe life into or to take notes in physics. And this process of aligning is in a way a process where you make the world your own. And I would like to write that here too, to make the world your own. And I called that aligning before. So you can structure it, you can bring a certain order in it. And then you discover meaning in the next step. And if you do that, you have a change of perspective in it because you have to ask yourself, okay, is it logical that we have boiling here? Is it logical that the ice cube is here on that side? And so on and so forth. And that means you have to remember what happened. And in the act of remembering it, you start to gain an overview and in that overview, you suddenly have the chance to catch a new idea, a new concept, and then to get a certain, to reach a certain vantage point where everything makes sense. And I think one of the central points is in Steiner World of Education related to general didactics, that you have that change of perspective from a more connection in the will realm or in the first person perspective and you move it into the conceptual realm and you go to the third person perspective by looking at it from the external. So if I would like to write down here changing perspective. And now you have the third person perspective predominant. If I had started here, for example, with the atoms, that would be a direct connection in a third person perspective approach. The atoms are responsible for everything. 
and then that change of perspective would be impossible. If I start here with the observation that I have a connection here and I try to change it in a phenomenological way to a third person perspective approach. And that might be the point of departure later to increase this external perspective towards modeling. Okay, we have that way here. And the wonderful experience we have in Steiner Waldorf schools, if we have a main lesson on a one day and then the other day, and the following day, and so on and so forth, we increase that change of perspective in a way that we present something on a day in the second phase of a main lesson. Then the students can connect with it and breathe life into it and order it. And we make the concept building the next day so that, so that the change of perspective can be done with enhanced intensity. And this way is a way that you really learn to accept emotionally the world like it is and then to look at it once again while staying calm, staying cautious and then start thinking in accordance to what had happened here. And if you do so, then I have the impression you develop good habits in a way to overcome in some way a tendency towards fake news because you develop habits that you can accept emotionally that something is like it is. And then you start thinking in accordance to that. It's developing good habits. Then I would like to introduce here something that like silent work. You can call it phase four, that is silent work. The students really have to work for 20 to 25 minutes on their own in my lessons. And then you start with a new shared encounter with the world and you pick it up the following day and so on and so forth. And the whole process here is, and now I would like to quote Axel Hugo, it is a process how to make the implicit explicit. Here something is implicitly present and here it becomes explicit. And doing phenomenology in science education means to develop a culture to make the implicit that is acting implicitly here, explicit in the conceptual realm, and the students have to do it by themselves through good open questions from the teachers. And now I would like to write here to make... Sorry. Can you see it? Yes. To make the implicit explicit. And if you succeed to do so, in my opinion, that is something like a performance art evoking insight. And to my, in my opinion, the artistic dimension in Steiner Ward of Education is to find good examples here in which something is implicitly present that can be really evoke insight here. So you need research to find good examples here. And then you have to be trained in a way that you have the capacity for good open questions to help the students to make the implicit explicit. So what do we need? We need good research. Otherwise, the general didactics of world of education do not make any sense because you need here really a shared encounter and you need a, not, a lot of knowledge here. You have to overcome not appropriate habits. For example, it is not here 
your job to have a cognitive activation of preconcepts. And here you know, your job is not just to restructure misconceptions. No, you have to provide something you can connect to. So I will just pick it up once again. So I was criticizing an approach where you have an activation of pre-knowledge here and the restructuring of that pre-knowledge here. I am supporting an approach where you develop good habits here, really to have a shared encounter. Then you make the implicit explicit. And then students with specific interests here can contribute afterwards what they have in their pre-knowledge and in other experiences. And then you can just give very different tasks in phase four in a silent work. And then you have the whole topic of inclusion in this part. And I think that this learning pathway to make the implicit explicit can be done if you have good examples. It is education against fake news and it is understanding born in the resonance space of embodiment because here you are in the will realm with all your interest and you use the resonance space of your embodiment. Then you have the change of perspective. You have a changing of perspective here. And then the meaning is created or discovered in a way that it still stays connected to it. So it is understanding born in the resonance space of embodiment. And at the very end, I just wanted to tell you that if you are interested in science and if you are curious, what about grade 10 or grade 11 or grade 12, you can just go on the YouTube channel of the research, Pedagogical Research Center in Kassel and Katharina will just give this YouTube channel into the chat and then you can see how to proceed in grade 10, 11 or 12. Okay, and now I will change my position and I am looking forward to your question. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much. We'll wait for you. That was a bit of a Waldorf school situation we have been in. Thank you so much. It was very nice to follow you on the blackboard. So let's see what questions are coming up. I will moderate now the um, question and answer session and looking forward to the chat, what's coming in. May I have again a question? Of course. Yes, please, Sorry, Wilfred, I will not do that too often, but can you demonstrate or can you explain on the demonstration you give you give with the with the cold hand warm and boiling water this second phase of co-presence? Yes, the first yes. phase I understand clearly. Yeah. But the second phase, co-presence, what does that mean? No, the second phase is a, I called it aligning. So I just will wait a minute. And now I just go to my document camera here. That is my document camera. So the first phase here, that is the, the demonstration. Yeah. And there, the demonstration. That's and I clear. call that co-presence because you dive into an atmosphere with everybody. And so you have a co-presence of the other students awareness of what is happening and the presence of the revelation of nature itself. Okay. So it, that is the co-presence here. Okay. 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 And that is 
something like a really a challenge because you have just to adapt to nature how it is. And then the taking notes. Yeah, that, that's clear. But that co-presence, that means that you together with your peers have that encounter of the demonstration. Yeah. Okay. You have a, uh, you have a common stream of interests that enables the nature to reveal itself with an increased intensity. Okay. 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 And that is the wonderful moment because nature can reveal itself with increased intensity in this demonstration because it is sustained like in a theater performance by the co-presence of the whole audience. That gives yeah, yeah, the yeah, whole yeah, revelation. Yeah. yeah, now I understand it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, okay. very good. There's a second question by uh, Dirk Rode, um, who says, thank you, Wilfried. Can you please say a bit more why you say breathe life into, in the second phase? All three phases seem to be very alive for me. Yeah, but it is really, first you are really only perceiving. And this perceiving is in that part a challenge that you really have to adapt or to accept the world like it is. And now you have to, in order to be able to connect with it, you have to be calm for a moment that you have to remember first happened this, then happened this and this, and that was wonderful. And you might experience in a museum, for example, if you have a lot of different paintings, after a time it is too much. For me, it is too much. Then I have to be seated for a moment. I have to repeat it. And then I get like a certain impression what I'm encountering in that museum. And then I can just breathe life into what I had experienced before. And then I can continue. And it is a very, it is a wonderful situation in class. If you have, I'm just going once again to my document camera. If you have here the taking notes, then you have first you are rem remembering, re remembering, and the students have something like one, two, three, and usually I do it in silent work. I just take your books out, everybody has to take notes, and I start working at the blackboard. And I'm just providing here several terms they can't know. And then they start to structure it. And if you do it, okay, I experienced this, that, and that. Then you will immediately realize that you see, oh, that was a wonderful situation. Oh, I like that very much, or that. So you can connect emotionally to it. And that very moment, your emotions are really your emotions. And now you breathe life into it. It's not just challenging. The world is outside of you. It's inside you. You breathe life into it. You make it your own. And so you have some, you have here immediately something that is striking or alienating. Alien, alienating. alienating. Or, or, or you have all the emotions here. Involved in Steiner's words, first you are completely incarnated in the body and now you enter the soul realm, you create the preconditions to start thinking in the next step. So it's like a development that starts in the will realm with all your intentions. And now I'm going to use Steiner's words. At the very first step, you draw the conclusion, the world is like it is. And here you form the judgment, I was there when it happened this way and it was this way. So I can say, yes, it was this way. And in the third step, you change the perspective and now you enter the realm of mental picturing. And now you can use forces of antipathy just to get an overview. Thank you. Um, 
I have a question myself, maybe it's a silly question, but just um, um, to get it right. Um, uh, am I wrong if I assume that those three steps are connected to what Steiner describes at a conclusion judgment concept, the three steps? Is it related directly or is it? Yes, um, it is so directly. I try to describe it in my words and to relate it to a discussion I met in general didactics and I just mm -hmm. used the word deliberately here when I saw, first of all, I draw the conclusion the world is like it is. Then I form yes. the judgment. I, okay, it has been exactly this way. I can say, yes, it was this way. And that is the point of departure to take a, go take a step back and look at it and to see, okay, the overall meaning, the concept to just compromise it, to comprehend it, is that. So I think Steiner really developed a sketch how thinking and experiences or perception and thinking can be connected in a learning pathway in a way that you have a resonant space of embodiment. Thank you. There are two more questions right now, first by Peter Latzka, then by Niels Schiemann. Uh, Peter, maybe you can put it yourself. Yeah, thank you, Wilfred. It's, it's, uh, I, I wish I was in your physics lessons in sixth grade. <clears throat> and the question I have is, is, you know, it all seems so logical. And it all seems, uh, you know, so apparent what you're saying. And it would interest me just what are the differences between uh, modern physics lessons in state schools today and what you and what you have been giving us. You know, uh, what, how does their approach and what ways does their approaches today differ from our approaches? We, now we are just going to a state school lesson and. First of all, I would like to say I have a research project at the moment how you can introduce in a phenomenological or contextual approach the atom. And the atom is a logical construction that brings together all the laws of preser preservation in physics in a very intelligent way. And I'm not going to criticize that at all. What I'm going to criticize now is if you imbue this model with the potential to make the world go round. And that would be a mainstream physics approach. And I'm showing that you with my document camera. Wait a minute. Okay, here it is. Here we have the baker. Here we have the water surface. And when we introduced the methylene blue, we saw that the methylene blue started moving. And of course, that methylene blue can only start moving if there are pinches or if there's a certain impact by the other fluid getting it to move. And why is that possible? If we think that move that liquid consisting of a lot of particles, then we can learn that, that these particles must move stronger and stronger the more the temperature rises. And then it really makes sense that at a certain temperature, the the energy that holds these particles together isn't strong enough that it is impossible for these particles just to leave the liquid and to go out here. But if the, the energy is strong enough, then they might leave and then they can move here without this bonding you have in the liquid. And so you have the particles here. And if the energy, the thermal energy is big enough that they can overcome the bonding energy here, 
then you get the gas and then you have boiling. What do I criticize here? I just deal with the liquid and the gas like it is like it was a solid, like it was just a particle here and the particles were moving. The liquid isn't a liquid, the liquid is an accumulation of particles here and the gas is a different accumulation of particles. And if you just explain everything with this particle structure here, that is not wrong at all, but it is a solid approach to liquid and gas. And the phenomenological approach offers that you have an inner movement and a tendency to develop form. And in this interaction between forming and dissolving, you can get a connection to the different phases of substances. And here you give the particles the power to define what a gas is. And a gas isn't still a gas and a liquid isn't still a liquid. And so now I'm using philosophical terms. That is from the structure here, from the structure, an alienating approach because you look always from the external perspective and you do not connect to the specific features of the substance itself. So everything is, physics just is controlling particles in the solid realm and controlling it by providing the right energy. And I offered something that is not just explaining, that is more understanding. And in mainstream subject related methodology in physics in Germany, you really use different terms. Explaining means this, and what I presented before means understanding. And we have really a community of phenomenologists who introduced that and Steiner Waldorf Education provides contexts connected to understanding. And if the students have reached a certain level of understanding, then they can see what the advantages of explaining using particles is. And they also can see what the disadvantage is. But in order to really make students aware of that discussions, you cannot do it in a main lesson block, so you need electives. And my position is without electives in high school, you can't show students where the real advantages of Steiner World of Education is. And we will get only an impact in the scientific community if we offer to a certain extent electives where students can get a certain overview and this dialogical dimension of being connected with the world, even on a high intellectual level. So phenomenology is not nice for grade six. Phenomenology is brilliant for all the grades. If you add some electives for students who are specifically interested in a broader context. And at the moment in my project, a contextual approach to the atom, I really testing it and I, it's possible. Dirk and I made a, did a seminar in Zurich and I think we reached some steps. Thank you. Then there is Niels with a question from Hogeschool Leiden. Niels, are you there somewhere? Yes, I am. Okay. Ah, hi Niels. Hello, Wilfried. Um, so my question was because it, 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 this is a beautiful lecture and it works perfectly with science. It works perfectly with when there is a fem something phenomenological to show. Uh, but you started with the story and I like that one because that's about language and it's a completely different part. But I was wondering, I, I, I wrote, maybe you give another example, but we don't have time for another example, I suppose. But, but I'm, I'm wondering, is the only approach for something that's not, that doesn't originate in nature, but rather in human convention, 
is then your only approach through stories. Or maybe there's other ang angles that you can uh, <laughs> that you can use to, to get to go through these steps that you showed us. Of course, you always can choose instead of a story or a presentation some material the students can work with. But then you have the discussion about the material you provide. And I'm not a history teacher, so I'm not going to talk about history. But as a teacher trainer, sometimes I have to look at biology lessons or chemistry lessons and so on. And in biology, you have something like the constitution of something and then you look at the function. And for example, if you meet first, now I'm missing the word, Aufbau und Funktion, Dirk, in Bio Biology, how do you call that? Somebody else has to help us. So, uh, Aufbau? Yeah, eines Organs und die Funktion. Yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it's not the shape, it's, it's uh, the form of the organ and its function. And you have that relation, for example, that you start with the form and then you relate to the function in the next step and then you can do it successfully. Or in yeah. biology, I met a lesson by Craig Haldrich where the students work in groups in the first phase and they try to find orders in different, with different plants and so on. In math, I taught a lot of math. It is finding a good, yes, providing a good exercise sheet and then you meet problems and then you can discuss problems in the first phase and then you can collect them and then you can find something similar in all the problems and that's the challenging part. So they can be very different and in literature you it is also different and but I'm not a literature teacher so it's not my business. No, no, no. I, I especially found, found grammar very very challenging. <laughs> okay to find good examples besides stories. Yeah. Thank you. It seems that there are no other questions. We have a bit, a couple of minutes more time. My question would be um, just one. It was a bit fast for me to understand um, the conclusion to say that this provides um, to be um, affected by, by fake news. So how um, that was a bit fast for me to understand it's yeah, some kind I, of a, um, medicine against fake news, your yeah. physics lessons. The structure of atomic physics is that there are atoms and the atoms are behind the experience appearances and make the appearances appear. Be behind the appearances is a structure with a potential, with a power to make the appearances appear. And that is comparable to conspiracy theories. There's something behind the appearance that makes the appearance appear in a certain way. And so the fact is not what it is. It is always something behind it that has the power to make the appearance appear. And that is a structurally alienating thinking. And you have that in conspiracy theories and you have it if you start with the atom. If you have a phenomenological approach, for example, in grade 11, and you see the electric interaction in very different parts of physics, and then you bring everything together in a logical construction, then the art atom is an element that provides order in a very intelligent way, but it has the power. So Steiner Waldorf education enables students, if the students have good teachers, that they can accept the atom mod model of the atom emotionally as model and they do not think the model is the very core substance of the world and that would is really an advantage okay okay 
I think we have to finish here. Thank you so much, Wilfried. That was a wonderful lecture. It was really like a wonderful performance. And I like that different angles of the camera very much. That was really um, enrichment. I think we have to have as many cameras as um, Wilfried has at Alanus too, Katharina, for our next lecture. It was really great. Thank you so much, Wilfried. Okay. And, bye -bye. Uh, and before, before, I finish, before I finish, I would like to announce two lectures. The one lecture is already online. This is the lecture by Neil Boland. Katharina has put it right now, the link into the chat. So Neil Bo Boland um, um, sent his lecture directly to us. It's a recorded one. But it's part of the series of lectures. You can, can see it. You, you got the announcement yesterday and you can watch that lecture by Neil Boland, um, A View from the Periphery, which is really wonderful, I think. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry we can't discuss it. And um, then there's the last lecture for, for um, within this series for right now, next week by Sven Saar from England. And this is about the child's learning experience. And I'm very much looking forward to it, Sven. Thank you so much, um, Wilfried, and have a good day, a good night to all of you and looking forward to see you. Is there, is there a question, uh, Peter, or are you just um, waving? Okay, so seeing you next week again. Goodbye. Bye. Thanks a lot bye. and bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Sehr schön, Wilfried.